Thank you very much. It's an honor to be able to speak with you today. I thought I'd just start on the first slide and, and just give you a preview of what you're going to hear. So I'm going to speak on nanotechnology and tissue engineering, and then I'm going to be followed by Frances Arnold at Caltech, and she's going to discuss uh, her work on engineering by evolution, actually rewriting the code of life. Uh, Dr. Zahn will speak next on the race to develop individualized medicine. Dr. Cordham will speak uh, on developing health innovation beyond traditional borders, and that will end with uh, Dr. Darcy on, Lord Darcy on engineering surgery. Well, so what I wanted to do is to tell you a little bit about materials and how engineering challenges, uh, how we might use engineering to, to maybe create new materials for the future. But I thought what I'd start with is let you know what's happened in the past. So if you look at the 20th century, almost all the materials and all the medical devices that were created were largely created by medical doctors. And what they did is they pretty much go to their house and they find an object that would kind of resemble the organ or tissue they wanted to fix. So for example, if you look at the artificial heart, but these are all true. I, I realize you may think they're funny, but they're true. Uh, and so if you look at the artificial heart, that was actually clinicians at the National Institutes of Health it, it go and, 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 and they went to their house and they said, well, what object kind of resembles a, like a heart, you know, has a good flex life? And they chose a lady's girdle. And that's what they made the artificial heart out of in 1967. But, but that's actually what it's made out of today. Because see, once you start down that path from like FDA or regulatory standpoint, it's very hard to change. And, and by the way, the artificial heart hasn't worked real well. You know, when blood hits the surface of the artificial heart, the lady's girdle material can form a clot, go to the patient's brain, and they could get a stroke, and they may die. And, and this problem really pervades all of medicine. Dialysis tubing with sausage casing, vascular graft, that's artificial blood vessel, was a surgeon going to a closed door to see what he could sew well with. And breast implants, one of them was a lubricant, another actually a mattress stuffing. I think people figured that out. But, so... so what I wanted to do is give you three examples of maybe where we could use engineering principles to create new materials. The first is actually nanotechnology. And, and the challenge here is let's say you had a drug that you want to deliver just like a cancer drug or, or a newer molecule like siRNA that you want to deliver just to a certain cell type. So how could you do that? Well, one of the ways that we and others have sometimes thought about that is maybe you could put those drugs in a nanoparticle. And the reason you want them in nanoparticles is because if they're under, a cell will, will take them up if they're under 200 nanometers or less. So you could put them in the nanoparticle, and then you could decorate the nanoparticle. And it's actually very challenging because you have to put materials on the nanoparticle that will enable these cells to avoid what are called macrophages that want to eat everything, and yet still target them to uh, the cell of interest, say the tumor cell. And so that's an illustration here. And then there's also manufacturing challenges because that's never really been done before. So we actually created a company to do nano, build, all, create all these nanomaterials. And, and I thought I would, because sometimes I don't always explain this so well, for, I was fortunate there's this TV show, Nova, and, and they actually came to our lab and they uh, did a film on some of what we were doing. So I actually stole their video on what we do because uh, it explains it so much better than I do. So let me uh, do this. He starts with a nanoparticle of anti-cancer drug. That gets encased in a plastic that releases the drug over time. That in turn gets a special wrapping that disguises the package as a water molecule to fool the body's immune system. And last but not least, the address where it should be delivered. A key that will only fit the lock of cancer cells. Now, I, I should say that the clinicians I work with have told me that it really doesn't blow the cell up quite like that. <laughs> but it kind of gives you the idea. And, and what was done, we actually published uh, last year in Science Translational Medicine, the first clinical trials, and, and it showed that it was safe. But what was particularly exciting is that there were a number of patients who actually were resistant to the drug. The drug we used was a taxotair, and we had targeting molecules to the tumor vasculature. And what you see in some of these cases, these are CAT scans of lungs, and you see the tumors. If you come back 42 days later, they're gone. That's one patient. Here's another. Uh, and now we're expanding these trials uh, to, to many, many more patients. So that's one example. Second example uh, is sort of gets to an aspect of potentially personalized medicine. I was actually watching a television show 
in the 1990s about how computer chips were, were manufactured. And when I watched this show, I, I, I wondered whether we could use that for a drug delivery system. Now again, if you spent over 30 years of your life working on drug delivery systems, you might think that about any television show. <laughs> but when I, I saw it, I talked to Michael Sima, one of my colleagues at MIT, and, we, uh, and a graduate student, John Santini, and we made some of these chips. This is a little bit different kind of chip, though. This chip, uh, we, we can actually put little, this is a cutaway, and we can put little wells in and cover it with like an inert metal like gold or platinum. And so you could put different doses of drug in, you could put um, uh, covers on, uh, on them, and, and also if you wanted to, you could put different kinds of drugs in. You could literally, if the drugs were potent enough, have a pharmacy on a chip. And, and I'll just show you an early chip that uh, John Santini, our student, made. So this is, it's all done like by photolithography and other kinds of approaches in using engineering. And, and you can um, have little wires going to these wells. You can actually make these pretty inexpensively. And here you have um, 34 wells. We can now make over 400 on a chip like this. Here's a United States dime, which is a, our smallest coin. And, and again, you don't have to make them look like sh you know, flat and small like this. They can be uh, like cylinders that you could inject or anything like that. To show you how they work, we'll just take a look at an individual well. It'll stay like this in the body for years, but if you um, come along and apply like by remote control, like radio frequency, you could even use something like this. In nanoseconds, off comes the cover. And when it does, whatever's underneath it can come out. So we had published a paper in Nature showing that you could release different amounts of uh, drug because they were put different amounts in different wells. And here, we did something more like the pharmacy on the chip, where we put multiple drugs coming out at different times. But what, and, and over the years, we kept trying to progress this forward in animal studies and actually most recently, human studies. So I thought I'd tell you the first human clinical trial about this, uh, which we published last year. And it may sound like space age medicine, but, it, but actually it, it happened. So what we did in this case is you can implant the chips in the body. They can, they're very tiny, but you can communicate with these chips over a special frequency called the Medical Implant Communication Service Band. In the US, it's approved by the FCC and the FDA. And if you wanted to change it for some reason, like, I mean, we have a program that, that's, in, that's in the whole unit, a computer program, but if you wanted to change it, you, there's actually a special computer code that can be put in if the doctor or patient wanted to change it or if you wanted to make it harder to tamper with, which I, I don't think will be a big problem, but uh, it does come up. And also, we have a bi-directional communications link between the chip and the receiver. The receiver, by the way, could be a cell phone, could be a BlackBerry, could be whatever you want it to be, to enable upload of the status, and including confirming that you actually did take the dose, the battery life, and so forth. And actually, I realize as I've gotten older that, that that's actually kind of important. I, like myself, I, I take a statin every day, and I because uh, I like to eat desserts and things like that. And, <laughs> But the thing is, is sometimes I, I ask myself, did I really take the drug? So I turn the bottle upside down or things like that. But what's nice about something like this is it'll actually let you know whether you did it or not. The clinical trial we did was actually done in Denmark. It was eight patients. These were women with osteoporosis. We picked them for a, a, this for a number of reasons. One, we wanted to give ourselves a, a, a fairly tough test because uh, people would generally, the reason people say things like this won't work is you'll get foreign body encapsulation, a large molecule can't get out. So that's a pretty large molecule, parathyroid hormone, which is what the women uh, take in this particular trial. Uh, also, we thought it's a place where we could make an impact because unfortunately, these are 70-year-old women and 75% of them don't do it. I mean, who wants to give yourself an injection every day? Um, and the drug is pretty potent, so we could actually ultimately put several years' supply in these, even longer. What was done is a small office procedure to implant it, and all the women surveyed actually said this was preferable to the injections. And what we got were what's called, and you did the trial, the same pharmacokinetics, meaning the drug being distributed in the body, with actually less variability than the injections. And the three major measures of treating osteoporosis were actually statistically indistinguishable. Just to show you a little bit of the data, um, here is the, the release curves at uh, day 60, uh, 84, 68, and 76. 
And like I say, they're actually closer than they would be with injections. There is a little bit of encapsulation. Here's a device. There's actually an antenna imprinted on the back of it so you can communicate with it, like I say, with whatever thing that you want. Uh, and there is encapsulation, but it's about 1 50th of what you get with a pacemaker. Uh, and the drug obviously can come out. And, and some of the things we're looking at are, you know, you could do, like, like I said, remote control drug delivery if you want. Someday, actually, we're also putting sensors on these so you could actually sense things in the body, which is certainly a challenge, and then tell the chip how much to deliver. The third and final example that I want to give you is uh, the idea uh, that uh, Jay Vacanti and I had a number of years ago. Jay is a head of pediatric surgery at Mass General. Uh, and we wrote a paper in Science, which is the idea that you could combine mammalian cells with plastics, with polymers, to create virtually any tissue or organ. And so the idea was that basically you could take different cell types, uh, dissociate those cells. If you inject them at random in the body, not much happens. But the cells are smart, and so if you put them close enough together, they can actually create new tissue structures. So we created polymer scaffolds uh, in whatever form you might want, grow them in what we call a bioreactor, uh, which is actually very important, the kind of stresses the cells get and so forth. And then the idea is you could make uh, virtually any tissue. So I thought I'd give you a few examples of what we tried to do. Um, so first, just to show you some pictures of the polymer scaffolds, this is the scaffolds with liver cells. But what I believe you'll be able to do someday is create imprints of virtually any tissue you want. So Prasad Shastri, who is one of our uh, postdocs, he now runs an institute in Germany, he used CAD-CAM techniques like computer-aided design to create these scaffolds in, in what, basically whatever shape you'd want. But they have to be about 98% porous, so you can put the cells in and have space for them to grow. So here he actually designed a nose. Now, I'm going to speculate that 40 years from now, maybe more, but that if somebody goes to a plastic surgeon... Uh, and they want a new nose, that there'll be a computer screen and it'll have pictures of all kinds of noses you could pick. And for example, like this might be a regular nose, but maybe somebody would want an upturned nose. And so that wouldn't be so hard to do. You'd take a little bit off. Let's say somebody wanted a hook nose. I mean, they probably wouldn't. <laughs> but, 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 but if they did, we'd give them a little bit more here. And then you could take their own cells, actually, as I'll show you, and try to make a, a, a tissue. So we've worked on this uh, with uh, Chuck Vacanti, who's Jay's brother, Linda Griffith, who was one of my uh, postdocs, now a, a, a professor at MIT. And we actually have made a cartilage tissue on a new uh, mice, which won't reject. In fact, if you're using the patient's own cells, they shouldn't reject either. So here, just as a proof of principle, we redid this guy's skull, this guy's cheek, if you open the animals up, it looks just like cartilage. It's white, glistening cartilage. It has the same biochemical components as regular cartilage, but um, it, it turns out it's not mechanically strong enough if you have an athletic injury, so that's a challenge we have to figure out. But you can actually make, at least for cosmetic purposes and others, do things that could really help patients. So one example, we actually have a project with the Army uh, where patients sometimes come back without certain body parts like ears. And so, we, so actually, uh, we've made scaffolds in the form of an ear. Uh, here's a high-powered scanning electron micrograph of it. Over time, these polymers, by the way, dissolve. We've designed them so they dissolve. And you'll get cells and extracellular matrix. And so you'll actually get an ear. And this has not yet been put on patients for ears. It has been put on patients, though, um, that uh, to, to uh, create... A, a new chest. Oh, here, well, here's the rabbit with the ear, I should say. So we actually put it on a ra rabbit, and, and we've actually put it on patients to make new chests. So this is actually a 12-year-old boy, and he likes to play baseball like other 12-year-olds. But see, if he ever got hit in the chest with a baseball, he, he could die. So we actually made him, Jay uh, uh, operated on him, we made him a scaffold and made him a new chest. Also, you can make new skin for burn victims. And I'll just show you an example of that. Here's a two-year-old boy. This is actually FDA approved. So here's a two-year-old boy, very badly burned. You can put the scaffold, which is cryopreserved cells, uh, on, on, and you can put it on at the time of the injury like this. Here he is three weeks later and six months later. Pretty much healed. And these are approved by the FDA uh, for patients with uh, burns and skin ulcers. And the final example that I thought I'd use to end this talk, and we're still early on this, is could you actually help people that are paralyzed, that have spinal cord 
need spinal cord repair. So Aaron Levick, one of our uh, graduate students now, professor at Case Western, made a scaffold, again, using engineering approaches that would have an outer portion that could help provide axonal guidance and an inner part where you might put neuronal stem cells. And she worked with uh, a surgeon, Ted Tang, and a stem cell expert, uh, Evan Snyder. And we actually put these in animals that were paralyzed. And uh, we followed them for 400 days. So I'm going to end with a couple of videos. Here's uh, the, the rat. And this is the paralyzed rat after 100 days with the control. Controls could be cells by themselves or material by itself or just a sham. And the key thing to notice is the paws are splayed in a rather awkward way and the animal is not able to support its own weight. There's actually quantitative ways of scoring these and we did uh, N of 12 or 13 in each group. So that's a control. Here's the experiment. This is the mean of the experimental group. It's not a cure what we've done, but it's a significant improvement. This guy, even though he's a little bit heavy, can support his own weight and the paws, as you see, are splayed in a much more normal fashion. And what we're now doing, you can see the paws here. What we're now doing, my wife actually tells me not to leave that on very long. Um, <laughs> so what we're now doing with some other surgeons is doing the same thing to monkeys as we could move forward to patients. And so I'm just going to show you the monkey trials, which are ongoing. And again, Here's the animal on a treadmill, and this leg is somewhat paralyzed. In a second, you'll see this guy starting up, and he has, will have the stem cell polymer scaffold in, and he's doing better. Again, not a cure, but an improvement. So there's still, a, and we hope that we'll actually be doing versions of this in the clinic in the near future. Um, so again, probably there's, uh, we've raised more questions than we've answered. We can... Uh, we've raised more questions than we've answered, but what I hope to have shown is that we're beginning to start to use engineering approaches, combining biology and materials to do things that are very, very different than just taking ladies' girdle materials and, uh, and, and, and uh, mattress stuffings to, to make the organs and tissues uh, in the body. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Robert. So I now invite Francis Arnold to take the lectern. <laughs> so 3D printing of the nose, that will, you'll all have your own choice of nose in the near future. So um, pretty big challenges face us, providing food, fuel, energy, water, and health and well-being to this planet's population without destroying the other members of the planet, uh, the biological world. All right, let's see if I can, there we go. And in fact, it's the other residents of the planet to whom I look uh, for inspiration and for solutions. Because I think that human engineers have a great deal to learn from biology. When you think about it, uh, remarkable for efficiency and elegance of the solutions it has to its own challenges. Think about it, living systems obtain energy and resources from the environment, convert that into self-replicating, self-reproducing machines. Living systems adapt, they evolve with time. And four billion years of Darwinian exploration, innovation, trial and error, success and failure has led to a spectacular array of solutions to the problem of being alive, which are constructed from equally spectacular molecular machines that do this work of transforming energy and matter into other forms. My prediction, along with many others, is that we will use some of nature's solutions to solve our problems. We heard about that this morning, synthetic biology from Craig Venter. And we'll also have to create new ones. And you heard some about that from Angie Belcher, who's doing some remarkable work in creating new biological entities. The short 60 years, though, that's been since the discovery of DNA's double helical structure has seen an incredible revolution in the technology. Now, we have not yet synthesized life from scratch. That has not yet happened, but we're getting wonderfully close to doing it. And um, we can synthesize an entire genome 
That's what we heard about this morning. Put it back into a cell, and a cell will read it as its own. The problem is, and this is where Craig Venter left off, is that we know how to synthesize DNA, but we don't know how to compose it. The products of evolution is like, it's like a Beethoven symphony. It's elegant, it's intricate, it's tremendously complex. And we don't know how to write music like this. All we do right now is grab bits and pieces from the environment, cobble them together in some new thing, and they're not necessarily well designed for what we want to do. Remember, organisms do a very good job at making other organisms, but we don't know how to compose the DNA for taking carbon dioxide and sunlight and turning that into gasoline. That's a highly non-natural function, and it's something we have not yet figured out how to do. And we certainly don't know what is the code for a longer, healthier life, as much as we would like to do that. So to compose new DNA, I look to the algorithm by which all this came about in the first place. We've been modifying the biological world for a very long time. This is not a new capability. But in the past, breeders had to rely on sexual recombination, where uh, monkeys go with monkeys, and corn goes with corn, and you can't really mix the two together. So this is what we've been doing for a very long time, but with the technology that's now available, remember, we can synthesize anything. <laughs> In the test tube, we can recombine monkeys and worms and you name it. And so here's, here's the real challenge, is that to compose new life, we take this new capability of modifying DNA in the test tube. And it's a big power, right? It's both a blessing and a curse, this power that we have, because we don't know the rules for breeding now at the molecular level. These are the challenges that the engineer faces, is we have this capability, we know we can design new biological entities, but we don't know whether it should be sex with three or 33, we don't know what level of mutations to dial into the process. And what can I create? What can I expect to make? A good breeder can anticipate what the progeny might look like and choose features that come out of that. We don't have this kind of experience in the laboratory, and that's the fun part, of course, that's the research. But I'll tell you, and I'll remind you, that no other engineering discipline has the ability with a reliable algorithmic process to take a bad design and turn it into a good one. That's the power of evolution. That's the power of artificial selection. And we should be able to use that. So in the last few minutes, let me just share with you a few examples on how we can improve on biology's designs for the benefit of humans, and particularly for health. Engineers, for quite a while, have recognized that the code for synthesizing important pharmaceutical, biologically active molecules like this one, Taxol, very important anti-cancer therapeutic, is encoded in the DNA of the organism that makes them. But very often, we don't have sufficient supply of these compounds, and they're far too complicated to synthesize in the laboratory. So why not take the DNA that encodes these things and transfer that into microorganisms, where that DNA can be optimized, the appropriate control sequences can be added, and you can then produce these compounds in large-scale fermentations for very low prices. And this is an extremely active and proficient area of research where products are being made and sold and commercialized now. The machines that do the work of converting cheap things like sugar into taxol are proteins like this, the enzymes, that really are truly amazing little engineering marvels. For example, this one, I know that many of you are not deeply into the chemistry as I'm in. But if you knew what this enzyme could do, it would knock your socks off. This enzyme can take oxygen from the air and insert it into a carbon-hydrogen bond. Think methane to methanol, one of the biggest problems. This enzyme can do that. Not only does it do it, it does it at room temperature pressure and in water. 
It does chemistry that we have not figured out how to do, but it learned how to take iron, an abundant metal, and activate it in such a way that the enzyme can hold a substrate in place and insert that oxygen. We, you have a bunch of these in your bodies, and with tools like these evolutionary design processes, where we can overcome our near complete ignorance of how the DNA does encode this function, we can create new versions in the laboratory that will mimic all of the capabilities of your human enzymes so that you can, for example, synthesize rapidly the metabolites of drugs and test them for toxicity. And what's even more exciting is that we can go on beyond where nature never wanted to go. Instead of just mimicking what nature has done, we can create versions of these enzymes that do whole new chemistries. And I won't go into the details because I don't have the time, but this is such an exciting area of chemistry research and uh, chemical engineering research where we can now incorporate into cells the vast repertoire of chemistries that synthetic organic chemists have learned over the last couple hundred years and encode them directly inside of cells so that the cells can be our factories for the future. Of course, proteins and biological entities do a lot more in healthcare than just make things. They are the therapeutics themselves. Think of the monoclonal antibodies or the enzymes that can be used to treat diseases. Those can be modified and improved in the laboratory through reliable engineering evolutionary processes. The future is wonderful. It's full of possibilities. When you think about how many things nature has already invented, for example, these amazing pore molecules that take light and respond to that by opening up a membrane, selectively allowing materials to pass through, the ultimate separation technology. Well, engineers have started to incorporate these, expressing them inside of neurons so that you can control the brain with light. Engineers have started to use viruses. I love Angie's work because she uses the virus to make a battery. Here's an example where engineers use viruses to deliver genetic material to difficult places like the photoreceptors of a retina. And when the uh, virus is evolved in the laboratory, you can reach many more parts of the eye than what a virus would naturally do. It becomes, working, it works for us now. So I'll close just by reminding you, this really is the era of synthetic biology. And I have to hope that we will use it to solve real problems. It's a powerful technology, and that the right life that we are going to write will be beautiful, and that it will enrich our own. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. I'd now like to invite Dr. Jean to this podium. Good afternoon, everyone. It has been very nice to be here to give this talk. Uh, but to be honest, this is the first time I give a talk in front of so many engineers and engineers to be and engineering scientists. But however, this is good. This is an enjoyable interaction. Since I clearly understand without the development of engineering technology, the, med the medicine or medical science will want to be developed sustainably or rapidly. Okay, um, the first of the slides I'd like, like to deliver to you is to try to mention the health is the key issue of global attention. In spite of the difference, differences in the social system or political system among different countries, even sometimes we see the local wars, but still the main thing of the world currently still is peace, development, and collaboration. At this background, so we, the human, the whole world, will pay attention to the health. So two messages I'd like to deliver, uh, de uh, deliver here. The first of all is that both the developed and the developing countries are facing the burden of major chronic disease, non-infectious disease like uh, malignant cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and so on, and also facing the threats of uh, infectious disease. Another issue I'd like to uh, deliver here is the disease profile in China currently cover the features of both developed and the developing country. 
Some of you, even in this morning, think that China is one of the rising superstar. So thank you for your nicely saying so, because uh, uh, when we're talking that China is a developed country, we still say uh, China is a developing country. So good things we like to know is uh, in most of the countries uh, currently, they have a consensus voice uh, from a government, community, media, uh, different societies and organizations, they think the control of the major disease is greatly, is largely dependent on the development of medical research, biotech research, and engineering research. This is a, we call this a modern model for the current medicine. Uh, they call this a translational medicine. In this model, the clinical observation, clinical questions, clinical demands will drive the whole models, will lead in these models. So because for the clinic, they need uh, discovery of new drugs, like the uh, you know, last two speakers already mentioned that. They need a good approach to make the earlier diagnosis that generate a bad therapeutic efficacy. Also generate a targeting therapy, uh, they will do the personal medicine. So because there is a demand, there is a question, so we need to conduct some basic research, like a genomic science, proteomics, met uh, metabolomics, and molecular biology, chemical biology. All those basic research and clinical research, pretty much they rely on the development of engineering research. So including microchips, sequence, molecular images, biomaterials, robots, uh, digital uh, the medicines, and about informatics. So I re review a little bit with the, the main thing of this uh, health session, the contribution of engineering research to the personalized medicine. Uh, today I just make examples uh, using the microchip and a sequence. Uh, this is uh, one of the, the thousand clinical observations why we need to develop personalized therapy. This is a breast cancer. Five patients clinically diagnosed very similar stage, like 2B. Patient has very similar age. According to this situation, doctor will apply the similar approaches for the treatment, but the outcome could be quite different. Two are good, follow up eight years. Eight years follow up, nothing happened, cured. But two of these five patients probably maybe one year later, they got a relapse. And another one, three years later, got a metastatic. So they will show you different metastases. So we need to understand the underlying mechanism from a molecular cellular signaling pathway because each patient probably maybe they will derived from alteration, in, uh, the different alteration of the signaling pathway. For example, the first one, P3, second one, BRCL1, third one, RAS, WINT, EGFR. So we need to use a powerful approach to individualize those patient. Because there is a situation, clinically, we often see insufficient treatment or over-treatment. For example, this is like a new adjuvant therapy. When we use a chemotherapy agent to treat a patient, and it will get a different outcome for each different, uh, for different groups of patient. Then we use a microchip. Uh, here we can divide it into two groups. The left one is sensitive, then we can go ahead and use, use this kind of uh, therapeutic agent, and then and the right one is non-responder. So we have to change or use another effective agent. Similar, uh, similarly, uh, for the infectious disease, Sometimes the clinician will use the first line to treat the patient, get a failed, then select the second one. So use uh, this uh, engineering, uh, the technology, we can divide, uh, we can uh, quickly divide the different types of uh, these uh, bacteria. So even the time is shorter, six hours versus the traditional, eight weeks, because sometimes the patient cannot wait too, uh, wait too long. Another big issue is for the TB. China currently is the second largest for TB uh, the, the country. Uh, the, the, this uh, critical issue uh, to generate uh, the good uh, 
therapy for the TB uh, treatment is, a, is how to conquer drug resistance. So use uh, this engineering uh, research, uh, the outcome that, that we can divide, use, actually use it as a microchip. We can divide it, we can quickly pick up the drug uh, resistance uh, use this array assay. Also versus like four to six hours versus uh, six, uh, four to eight hour, uh, weeks. Another issue, the big issue in China is HPV uh, infection. So we have a large population of people. It's about like uh, uh, eight million people got infected by the HPV. And uh, some of that were developed to the liver cancer. Uh, liver cancer. So when we treat this HPV virus, and we also will see the, uh, the echo of this virus are resistant to, this, uh, uh, to the therapy. So we need to pick up this uh, resistance and select the uh, efficient approach for the treatment. Uh, this is for the microchip. Another issue uh, will very much to help the personalized medicine is a sequencer. So this is the development, the, the different milestones of a sequence technology. Okay, uh, the last year, the UK government uh, launched a program. They will sequence like 100,000 people for the whole genome. They believe, I think they are convinced by the scientists, scientists of the community, they be, believe these, uh, to get good understanding of the whole genome, definitely they will help the treatment of both cancer and the rare disease. This is why the UK government uh, put this uh, governmental support, this issue. And with this uh, sequence technology, and we, uh, we can pick up mutations like a congenital amaurosis, and otherwise a superficial actinic parokeratonesis. And this is recent work, and we, uh, we uh, just finished, not published yet, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, did a whole genome sequence to pick up genomic alterations in esophageal cancer. Because uh, the esophageal cancer mortality in China, China will take like more than 50% uh, count, uh, compared to uh, whole world for the esophageal cancer caused the cancer deaths. So the red one, it's a, so I couldn't see the other one. Anyway, the red and green one is a metastasis, another one is a non-metastasis. If without a metastasis, the patient could survive longer. So we can pick up this patient. And also profile of mutation, amplification, and the, like uh, structure alteration uh, can lead to the personalized the therapeutic approaches. Uh, another, the final example I pick up, uh, we, uh, the, 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 our scientists in China, they did the studies to analyze the, uh, the gastric um, bacteria and uh, the pick up association with type two diabetes. Okay, according to uh, what I just presented, and again, review the theme of the session, how the new technology can be used to enhance the quality of the care available in our clinic and hospitals and to offer a healthier future to the development of the world. So we need to clearly understand what is underlying uh, the challenge. I have three thoughts here, put here. The first of all, we do need more innovative engineering technology like many scientists presented here and were presented in the next two days. But sometimes the quality of care is not only dependent on the invention of a new technology, but also the research model. We like to see the interaction between engineers, engineering scientists, and the medical scientists and the clinicians, and which will integrate technologies into clinical demands. So this is the second point. The third point I'd like to bring here is the breakthrough of technology are important. But again, but making this technology practical and available is more important because a lot of the community and uh, even in the rural area, the mountain area, they need practical technology to do the individualized therapy. So for last slide, I, I presented here a few questions. So first of all, we need to develop effective communication between clinicians and the researchers in order to translate clinical observation, demand questions into scientific issues, uh, convert into scientific issues. Uh, I believe maybe uh, uh, one or two more the uh, clinical experts will deliver, uh, deliver more uh, presentations here. Secondly, the how to develop the high quality clinical information related to the biobank. Uh, we need to the 
This bell bank is dependent on the, the complete clinical information. The third, the how to develop the national network among multiple clinical centers to, uh, to fac facilitate the data sharing. So I, I believe the United States and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, United Kingdom have done a good job. We'd like to learn from you. And the last point I'd like to put here is how to develop interna international collaboration, which is able to attract the interest from uh, scientists, either like a medical scientist, engineering scientists, and clinical experts in different countries in order to conquer global health threats. This is the main thing. This is um, the goal of this uh, grand challenge. I'd like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's really an honor to be here this afternoon. I'm losing my voice a little bit, so I apologize in advance if I sound like Minnie Mouse. <laughs> We've talked a lot today about the challenges associated with translating new technologies from the lab into clinical practice. But sadly, our efforts to translate these technologies often do not extend beyond the borders of the developing world. Who pays the price for these failures? Four summers ago, I met these three little girls outside St. Gabriel's Hospital in Namatete, Malawi. I love this picture. These little girls are so beautiful and so funny, but the health challenges that they face are enormous. Every year, 8 million children under the age of 5 die. 98% of the children who die live in the developing world. We lose little girls like these, and they could be saved with technologies that are readily available in the developed world. This photo shows a primary care lab in the developing world, and there are only two pieces of equipment in this lab. There's a microscope, which is next to the window because there's no electricity, and so the sunlight serves as a light source. And there's a hand crank centrifuge. Clearly, innovation could transform healthcare in this setting, but the technology needs of this clinic are largely invisible to technology developers. And in some ways, this isn't surprising. Who would pay for these technologies? How would we get them there? There's no infrastructure to support them. There's no supply chain to deliver them. And if they break, there's no one to repair them. If we truly believe that healthcare innovation should be available to all the world's citizens, we have to think about innovation in a different way. And today I'd like to share three examples of how we might do this. This photo shows the neonatal nursery at the largest teaching hospital in Malawi. At times, often, as many as four babies have to share one bed. In Malawi, 18% of babies are born too soon, the highest rate of preterm birth in the world. Over half of all premature babies struggle to breathe because their lungs are immature. In Malawi, as you see here, the only therapy available to treat babies with breathing difficulties is nasal oxygen. In the 1950s, this is the therapy that was available for babies with respiratory distress in the United States. And we know from historical data that with nasal oxygen alone, only one of those four babies will survive. Since the 1970s, however, we've been easily able to treat respiratory distress using a technology called bubble CPAP. And in the United States, the introduction of bubble CPAP raised the survival rate for babies like this from 25% to 75%. But at $6,000, bubble CPAP machines are simply too expensive for most developing world hospitals. With clinicians from the United States and Malawi, we tasked a team of engineering students with designing a bubble CPAP device for the developing world. In a year-long capstone design course, this team of students engineered a $160 device that delivered the same therapeutic flow and pressure as the systems routinely used in the developed world. With clinicians from the US and Malawi, we tested the efficacy of this device. Just like in the United States, what we found was that the survival for these babies rose from a baseline of 24% to 70%. 
With support now from USAID, the Ministry of Health in Malawi, and a commercial partner, we are now implementing this technology at all government hospitals in Malawi. This photo shows Jocelyn Brown, one of the students that designed the original CPAP device. And since graduation, she's been working in Malawi to disseminate this technology. Last month, she helped introduce CPAP at Machinga District Hospital. Afterwards, one of the nurses came up to her and revealed that her baby was one of the babies in the initial CPAP trial. Her daughter was born prematurely, and as you can see here now, six months later, she's doing very well. With students like Jocelyn, we're working to develop the nursery of the future for district hospitals in the developing world, a comprehensive set of highly effective, affordable technologies to help newborns survive and thrive. We estimate that a nursery of the future for a district hospital serving 300,000 people could be outfitted for only $5,000, less than the cost of one Western-style ventilator. Like many developing countries, Malawi is also facing a growing burden of chronic disease like cancer. Cervical cancer is the leading cause of death for women in sub-Saharan Africa. A year ago, I asked Alex at St. Gabriel's Hospital to tell me about the challenges that he and his team of community healthcare workers face in dealing with cervical cancer. He reached into his desk and he pulled out a bottle of morphine. And he explained that his team cares for many homebound women who are dying from cervical cancer. To help manage pain, workers leave behind bottles of liquid morphine, and they instruct family members to pour the correct dosage of morphine uh, round the clock. And he asked our team to help develop a better dosing system to manage pain relief and allow women to die with dignity. And we helped him with that. I don't have time to tell you about it. But what I want to focus here on is the fact that we should not be thinking about palliation because we know how to prevent cervical cancer. We know with early detection and with vaccination, we can prevent cervical uh, cancer. And we know exactly who to target. Women who are HIV positive are at particular risk of developing cervical cancer. This is an HIV clinic in Swaziland, and there's a poster on the back of the wall that counsels HIV-positive women to get screened for cervical cancer. So I asked the nurse at this clinic how many pap smears they had performed in the last year, and the answer was zero, because they simply did not have the infrastructure or the supplies to implement screening programs that have been so successful in the developed world. As part of the Red Ribbon Pink Ribbon campaign, nurses are now using a technique called visual inspection to identify precancerous lesions of the cervix. The problem with visual inspection is that only about half of the lesions that they identify actually require treatment. They have to treat everyone, and so precious resources are wasted. Now, while the infrastructure for screening is absent in the developing world, cell phones are everywhere. Taking note of this, our team developed a cell phone microscope that could be used to improve the uh, identification of these precancerous lesions. This slide shows photos of the cervix from two women, and both have lesions that would trigger treatment, but only one actually requires treatment. Here you can see the fiber optic probe on those cervical lesions, and it allows the providers to visualize the nuclei within those cells, and you can easily tell that the nuclei are enlarged and crowded on the bottom. That's the woman who requires treatment whereas they're not on the top. Studies in China and Botswana using this technology have shown that we can reduce by half the amount of overtreatment using this very simple technology. And more importantly, we can leverage decades of investment by the consumer electronics industry to create the diagnostic lab of the future, where we can create palm-sized battery-powered readers that can be made for less than $10. They can be coupled with microfluidic devices to enable sensitive testing for nucleic acids, proteins, and metabolites at the point of care, reducing per test cost by as much as two orders of magnitude. Today, there is a groundswell of student activism to change the future of global health. How can we ensure that the next generation of engineers is fully engaged in this effort? Recently, I came across an old book that I think holds part of the answer. The Boy Engineer was published 50 years ago in an effort to recruit more young people to the field of engineering. And in the first chapter, the author writes, 
the nations of the free world are engaged in fierce and real competition with nations ruled by dictators. The winners in this competition will be those governments which, while maintaining peace, supply their peoples with the highest standard of living. And in this age of technology, engineers are behind a large proportion of the advances in the standard of living. In the midst of the Cold War, expanding the pipeline of future engineers, at least boy engineers, was an important priority. It was critical both to national security and economic competitiveness. Today, I think we have an opportunity to embrace a new kind of international engagement for engineers, which I think is important both for humanitarian as well as national security reasons. Engineering students are so excited about the technical challenges associated with improving health in the developing world. And these students recognize the importance of working with their peers throughout the world to design technologies that can be used at teaching hospitals in Malawi and at rural clinics in Swaziland. But the need to build engineering capacity in Africa remains great. The number of engineers emigrating from South Africa, it's been estimated, is equivalent to the number who are graduating annually. Yet African, African governments are starting to invest in this area. Ethiopia just started its first biomedical engineering undergraduate program. And at Tegbarid University, the biomedical technician training program is engaging their students in the design of appropriate technologies. And these efforts provide very interesting opportunities for partnership. So in closing, I challenge you, all of you, to think about how you can make addressing these very important challenges at least a small part of your professional efforts. Because I think if, as engineers, we can reach beyond the boundaries of our discipline and partner with NGOs, and industry and policy making groups, the resulting technologies will have global benefit. Thank you. Thank you. So, our fifth and final speaker of the session is Professor Ara Dazi. Uh, thank you. Could I thank the organizers for inviting me? And you probably will see from the title of the talk, I'm a surgeon, but I have to admit in the presence of this august audience, I'm also a failed engineer and a failed policymaker. And interestingly enough, the organizers have asked me to speak about engineering in surgery and policymaking. So I will try my best uh, over the next uh, 10 minutes or so. I think it's worthwhile to start off with and, and recognizing the contribution that engineering has made in healthcare. And look at the last century, some of the major advances, some of the major discoveries that has really doubled the life expectancy of mankind. Now, you think of any other sector who has contributed to humanity to such a degree, doubling the life expectancy, a phenomenal achievement. Engineering had a huge role to play, and I could confidently tell you, over the last 50 years, 40% of the major breakthroughs in engineering and really the contribution to increasing life expectancy have come from this country. It's also interesting to point out to you that the beginning of that century, every family was spending the twice amount of money on funerals than they were on health care. Towards the end of that century, we're near enough spending 8.3% of our GDP on healthcare in the UK. And if you cross the Atlantic, they are a complete basket case. They're spending 19% of their expenditure on healthcare. And it's fascinating to see the return on that investment. So, what are the challenges facing us? If you are a policymaker, if you're an engineer here, there are some young people here, what are the big inventions that we need to think of in the future? The landscape is changing very eloquently described, the burden of disease is not just increasing, but it's also changing. Lifestyle diseases. Who would have predicted three decades ago we'd be talking about an epidemic in obesity? Patients' expectations are changing. We always blame politicians in increasing patient expectations. 1948, when the NHS was created, it was a post-war I need generation. We're dealing with the generation, iPod generation now. I can and I want. And that's a very different way of managing such patients. Rising unit cost is something about innovation in healthcare. For some reason, in the minds of policymakers, it seems to add cost, where innovation in any other sector improves quality, improves access, and reduces cost. 
I'll tell you why. We're very good in commissioning new services, new technologies in healthcare. We are terrible in decommissioning the old stuff. There's always some surgeon who wants to do something differently, or the old way. And that's the way, and that is a challenge. So what is innovation? I think it's important to recognize not just the technological innovation that we see on the back of engineering, but the huge amount of process engineering that has huge impact in saving more lives in this world. And I'm going to share with you some examples. Firstly, let me start with my own uh, work. I happen to work in Imperial, extremely fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, working with very, very, very clever engineers and scientists. A few of them are in this room. I see Dick Kidney there. I can see Guang Zongyang, who's my partner in crime for the last decade. Most of our work has been in devices, gizmos. I'm the gizmo man. I actually take these gizmos in the operating theater and see what I could do. And the biggest revolution in my career has been reducing the physical and psychological trauma of surgery. In the old days, I was maximally invasive surgeon. The bigger the incision, the more macho, the better surgeon I was. I am a now a miniature surgeon. I'm a minimally invasive surgeon. I do tiny incisions to make patients get out of there quicker. And what, I've, what we've done back to the last century we, technology has added years to our lives. The big challenge we have in surgery now, how do we add life to these years? In other words, how do we improve the quality of life after surgery? The use of data. We have wealth of preoperative data. Imaging, CT scans, MRIs, wealth of data. Only used for diagnostic purposes. Why don't we use that data during a surgical procedure? To enhance the ability of a surgeon to do a more accurate a more precise procedure? Why don't we use post-operative monitoring using sensing technologies that are available? There are more sensors in a Formula One driver uh, car than there is, for example, in a post-operative patient in intensive care. How could we translate some of that innovation into the management of the extremely sick patient? And our work has been mostly based on the use of the three attributes of a surgeon, although most would not believe there is a cognitive element to surgery, uh, but there is. Uh, there is a perceptual element, obviously, and there is the motor control, and this is me doing laparoscopic or keyhole surgery. And the ability to use that data set, in this case, in image augmentation during the operation. Could we, for example, superimpose the tumor, a tiny tumor, in the ear of screening in a very large solid organ and do a segmental resection rather than a major resection? Is really what's driving this type of work. Could we identify prostate uh, during a radical prostatectomy, the hypogastric nerve? in not just curing a patient from cancer at a young age, but not rendering them incompetent and impotent after an operation. That is where improving the quality of surgery is going. One of the major iatrogenic injury to your brain during a cardio coronary artery bypass graft is not the operation. It's when you put the patient on a heart and lung bypass. A massive engineering discovery revolutionized uh, uh, coronary artery vas vascular vascularization. However, we've also discovered it does some funny things to your brain for the first eight weeks after the operation. So the challenge was, could you do this operation without putting the heart on a heart and lung bypass machine? And this is one of the main drivers funded by EPSRC. Uh, and, the, and the concept was to use the case contingent motion stabilization technology. In other words, measuring the depth of the tissue. If you know the tissue characteristics, could we move the scope at the same rate as the beating heart and display to the surgeon a static image? And at the same time, waken up the nieces because that is when they wake up, when the heart stops. In actual fact, the heart hasn't stopped. You are fooling the system and you're displaying to the surgeon a static image. Could you, for example, introduce safety zones into the... Into the we are all human. Error is human. The ability of a surgeon to control their, if you like, the safety zone during that operative procedure. In this case, again, a radical prostatectomy, a funnel-shaped space in the green space, in which the surgeon cannot operate above and beyond, what we call the gaze contingent haptic constraint, or a force feedback. I love to create force feedback in Parliament with politicians to prevent them going sideways. That is the type, that is the type of safety technology. And let's not forget, in the era of safety, uh, and this is a uh, publication from the Institute of Medicine, very, very eloquently, the number of patients, the death rates from avoidable deaths 
is equivalent to a jumbo jet crashing every three days. That is a well-known fact, and we are, in this country, going through an interesting phase at the moment with a, one of our, major, uh, one of our uh, providers who has been seriously impacted by safety issues. So what is surgery is all about? This is Langebusch. This is the 100 years ago doing a gallbladder operation through a big open incision, big macho incision. This is keyhole era where we're going to next is using natural orifice to gain access to either the abdominal cavity or the chest cavity to do a surgical procedure. So-called incision-less surgery. You know, that's a paradox in itself, incision-less surgery. So it's not just about gizmos. I'm always described the, as the low-impact, high-cost surgeon. It's about process innovation, too. And let's bring that back. Simple stuff that we can borrow from the engineering sciences, manufacturing, back to the 1940s. Very few of this has translated into healthcare. A simple surgical safety checklist. 19 indicators, evidence-based. We know they all work. If you give their patients antibiotics 20 minutes before you make an incision, the wound infection rate drops by about 30%. If you make sure you check with the nurse and the anesthetist which site you're doing the operation, wrong site surgery drops com completely. 19 indicators. <laughs> you laugh. Look at the baseline, look at the checklist data. This study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Simple process innovation. I would love every medical student or a postgraduate surgical student to do an engineering course for six weeks to learn about the skills of process engineering. I would love every doctor who's hand on, handing over a patient to another doctor to go to an engineering school to learn the skills of handing over something in a pipeline or a chain. And that is, that is a reasonable example. Now, I think we heard this beautifully touching talk about the developing world. But there's also something very exciting happening in that part of the world. And mostly, not, we call them emerging economies. They're actually emerged. They're well emerged now where we are. And this is a piece of work that I had the fortune of leading policy work with the World Economic Forum published in Davos a few years ago, and that is looking at innovative delivery models across the globe. And what's unique in this study, some of the major innovations are actually coming from the southern hemisphere and towards east. And we saw some examples of that uh, in the previous speaker. And let's look at India, the Aravind Eye Centre. They do 200, nearly quarter of a million cataracts a year. They make their own lenses, okay? The cost of the procedure is $35, $36. The gross margin rates and the return of capital is greater than Moorfields, which is up the road from here, which is one of our best, best eye hospital. Now, it's interesting if you look at their principles of innovation. It's all about world-class quality. It's about reducing cost. It's about scaling it and making it affordable. So any PhD student here, we better look east and see what they're doing there. There are amazing innovations that are coming here that we can learn a lot from. On that note, thank you again for your time and thank you for having me here. Thank you very much to all our speakers. So, okay, we now move into the Q&A session. If we could have the house lights up a bit and... Uh, I guess you're all getting familiar with the, the format. Wait for the uh, microphone to arrive, speak clearly. And, and I'm going to try this session to, to, to get some questioners from up in the gallery. I apologize to people up there that I sort of promised I'd get, come to them and we ran out of time last, last time. Um, but, but I do want to um, start just to kick off the, the, the discussion by asking a question myself. We, I guess this is probably to you, Rebecca and Ara. The, um, we heard a lot from Francis and Robert and earlier Craig Venter about bioengineering and synthetic biology and some of the wonderful things that are happening. But to what extent should research to tackle global health problems be focusing maybe more upstream on, on preventative measures rather than cures? Do you think enough is being done? All right. Well, I'll start with that. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, I think, firstly, setting up the context. Sadly, our healthcare systems... If I could just stop talking about the developing world. Our developed world healthcare systems are designed as sickness services. They're not designed as a health and a well-being service. And back to how much money we spend. You know, it is not, it's a very honorable thing to be spending 19% of your GDP on healthcare in the US or 9% here. But that is not sustainable. And I think everyone realizes that. 
And that the only way you can make sustainable is actually transforming that health care from a sickness service to a health and well-being service. So back to the developing world, I very much hope they don't repeat our mistakes. And how do we help them in actually designing their own systems which works best for them rather than imposing on them systems that are defunct in the West? Thank you. Yeah, and I yeah. agree. There's just absolutely not the resources available to deal with the downstream effects of chronic disease. And so I think the focus in the developing world needs to be on prevention. And I think done well, there are lessons that can be taken for the developed world from that. There's real reasons to invest in that. Thank you. Okay, so let's have some show, show of hands. Wow. Okay, so uh, we have a gentleman there in the middle with his hand up and, um, and a gentleman there. So the first two. Thank you. My name is Hugh, and uh, I have a question for Mr. Kui Min Zan. Yes. Uh, I'm a student from Vietnam, and I know that in Vietnam, China, and in Asian countries, we've been using the oriental medicine treatment, and in which we use dry herbs or dry roots instead of the Western uh, treatment. Uh, so they are, uh, they are very cheap uh, treatment, and I wonder if we can use, uh, and it has a great some uh, success without side effects. So I wonder if we can use engineering um, knowledge to explain the mysterious behind those treatments. And do you think that we can learn from the nature? And we, what do you think about the f uh, potential future of using those treatments for cancer or any heart treatment um, disease? Mm -hmm. OK. Well, this is a good question. So uh, the, uh, some information I'd like to deliver to you. Uh, currently, China launched the two, uh, we call it a mega project. So it's a, it's a, I mean, the mega project means the I'm mean, supporting amount of the money, governmental support is a, is the biggest than ever we have done, and one is drug discovery. Uh, among these drug discovery mega project, and one of the major issue is to try to develop a traditional medicine. Since uh, Chinese traditional medicine supported Chinese people survive for five thousand years, so but another, uh, but one important issue is to try to use, uh, like you just mentioned, use uh, the modern this uh, scientific technology uh, try to evaluate uh, these. Uh, the one is uh, like a screen effective, like a natural products. So this is one thing, try to, uh, try to uh, get this effective natural product, develop that to the clin uh, clinical application. Another issue is uh, try to develop like a clinical trial, use uh, the, uh, we call it uh, scientific and also regular, uh, the, the fit to the, the Western medicine clinical trials try to make this drug more standard and more uh, I mean, acceptable by the, the whole world community. So this is one issue we are addressing right now in China. Thank you. Yes. Hi, um, good afternoon. Uh, this is a comment, actually. So uh, could you have your name? And oh, sorry. Yeah, my name is Hari Pujar. I'm from Merck in the US. Uh, this is a comment for uh, Rebecca Richards-Scortum. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk on uh, respiratory pathology and uh, HPV and, and the work that you've done. Um, I just want to note that uh, we at Merck, engineers at Merck actually, are working on uh, vaccination approaches to extend the reach of uh, pneumococcal and HPV vaccines uh, in the very parts of Africa that you mentioned uh, by way of low-cost manufacturing, uh, development of thermostable vaccines. So I just wanted to make that comment, but thank you for the excellent talk. Thank you. So. Second row here at the, in the middle, and the gentleman right at the back next. The lady in the middle. Sorry, just here. Hi, my name is Sujata Bhatia, and I teach biomedical engineering at Harvard. And my question is for all of the panelists, do you think that medical doctors and scientists and engineers um, from the developing world are uh, being appropriately involved in um, the development of novel medical devices, meaning that um, one thing that I've been concerned about is that we often will, um, you know, train our students to develop new medical devices um, and then sort of ship them over to the developing world where, as you're probably well aware, Professor Richards Cordum, you know, 70% uh, of them sit unused due to lack of, of uh, infrastructure. So could we be doing more to actually, you know, be partnering with scientists and engineers from the developing world to do this? 
I guess it's probably still back over to the slide. <laughs> I can take a shot at answering that. I think um, one of the things that we have done very well is to partner with medical schools in the developing world. So NIH has funded a network called MEPI, which is a medical education partnership initiative. And it's all about improving the infrastructure for research by developing world clinicians in the developing world. It's an excellent model that could be used for engineering, but we're not doing the same thing on the engineering side. It's a big gap. Thank you. Yes. Medical, uh, Roger Gonzalez, Biomedical Engineering from University of Texas at El Paso. I've been involved with developing technologies uh, for a developing world for over a decade. And it seems to me that when you develop these technologies, they're pretty limited in their application unless you seem to get a commercial entity to really expand on this because of the distribution system. So I know that, Rebecca, you've been doing some of this stuff. and, and and also, the issue related to the previous question, there's issues of hardware and software. You can develop the right hardware, but unless the sufficient training follows that, the effectiveness of the hardware is, is limited. So it's kind of a two-part question, both the issue of how do you expand the impact of that through commercializing to some extent the technology and then being able to provide that training. It's back to you, I think. <laughs> in in Someone terms else. of um, commercializing these technologies so that on. they have sustainable impact, one of the most exciting things I have seen happen in the last three years is to see much greater interest on the part of large medical device and pharma companies like Merck, um, but also GE and their rural health division, Becton Dickinson, many of these large companies are showing much more interest in developing devices and drugs for the developing world. It's largely been motivated by more of the middle income countries, but not exclusively. So I think it's a really wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Anyone else want to comment? No, good. Okay, so yes. Uh, so Peter, bon Peter Bonfield from Building Research Establishment here in the UK. Very curious about, Rebecca, some of these low cost ways of delivering care and then the link to the earlier comment about delivering health and well-being rather than the sickness treatment. And I wonder in the developed world where we stand with respect to with our mobile phones and, and other things, having systems that individuals can use to help maintain and improve their health, health and well-being so we sort of get better outcomes for our societies in the developed and developing worlds. Very interesting question, and I think there are so many new mobile health applications that are being developed, but there is a complete lack of research to look at the effectiveness of those mobile health um, applications, and so I think that's really where the burden from the research perspective needs to be, is what are the ones that are successful? Do they have impact or not? Oh. Just, just to add to that. We, we recently published a, a commission on healthcare technologies in the Lancet, which might be an interesting read uh, for me it was, uh, being involved in that commission. And as point, I think the trick here is the mindset change, is that technology developed in the UK and the US is going to transform something in Africa. That is not necessarily true. And I think it's taken us a long time to understand that. Uh, and, and in, in many ways, and I think the GE is a good example, the new, new mobile ultrasound, which is, you know, tenth of the cost of an ultrasound machine, is saving many, many lives in there. It's simple. It tells you whether the baby is breech or not. Uh, another technology developed locally, this e-rangers, which is an ambulance. We know there are certain parts of the Africa. You can actually have an ambulance because your tires bust up and using it for 48 hours. So the, coming up with a technology, uh, a mobile system that is allowing you to, to meet the local needs is, I think, where it needs to go. But mobile telephony, that's fascinating because you probably do know there's more mobile telephones per capita in Africa than there is anywhere in the world. Can I add some mm. comments? So I'd like to add some comments so, uh, in this issue. I mean, the two mentioned, I mean, African, but still in some area of China, the uh, recent years, and the Chinese government increased the money to uh, uh, to increase uh, to uh, expand the coverage. Right now, by the end of this year, uh, I think maybe 97 percent of countryside people will be covered. But still, the amount is still low. I mean, at this status, so we need to develop 
some uh, devices, medical, I mean, equipment could be used in countryside uh, to serve those farmers. I mean, in addition to you develop a high quality, could be used in like a large and academic hospital, medical centers, but still, this is why, you know, I emphasize it several times to, uh, I mean, to, you know, uh, form this new model to serve the majority of like people, as, I mean, make the, every uh, uh, citizens to enjoy in this, uh, uh, science, technology. Thank you. So, a question or up there? Uh, Eric Clavens from the University of Washington. So, um, most engineers, this is sort of an ethical question for engineers. So, most engineers uh, that I talk to would say that they don't really care where their funding comes from as long as they work on something fundamental, something that, that they think maybe could have applications in, in a lot of different areas. But as we've seen, if you have funding from USAID, you'll probably work on something that has much more likelihood of being applied to you know, an important uh, global development problem. To what extent do, whereas if you get your funding from NIH, you might be working on immortality, for example. Um, to what extent do we as engineers have to pick and choose our funding uh, and to what extent can we influence how the funding uh, in our countries um, is directed? Francis and Robert, you know I'm going to come to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I wow, so unfair. <laughs> well, I I'd like to think that fundamental. I mean, I think there's different things. I'd like to think that fundamental engineering research can be used globally. I mean, again, I think if you look at, at what both Francis and I talked about, I mean, clearly there's, you know, applications in the United States, but I'll, I'll just pick a little bit of what, what we're doing, and I'm sure Francis can do the same, but, you know, so we've done a lot of work on what I'll call, I call controlled release systems that can deliver drugs for long times and control the patterns and so forth. And actually, I should say, when we first proposed that, we couldn't get any money for it from the NIH. People didn't feel you could do some of those things. But over time, we did get funding. And I would say then, fairly, you know, in the last 15 or 20 years, we also got some funding from the World Health Organization and from the Gates Foundation to apply those very principles to better vaccine delivery for polio vaccine and all kinds of things that might be helpful in the third world. And so I think when you do fundamental engineering research, and, and, and I think Francis can say the same thing in, in her area. I, I think it really, you create principles that can be applied across the board. I think some of the challenges are, came up in the questions and some of the things that uh, Rebecca talked about is even if you create them, then how do you distribute them? How do you get companies to make them? But I think from the science standpoint, I feel like the kinds of things we're doing um, you know, can be useful for, for the third world. And really the challenge is to get any funding agency to want to fund really long-range basic engineering or scientific research, in, in my opinion, because there's just such a, always a high level of skepticism if anybody's doing anything new. Anyhow, I'll let it turn it over to you. <laughs> I, I just want to reiterate what Craig Venter said this morning, that the solutions eventually come from science. Science is 100% of the solution. How you implement the science is the next step, and that's to me, even more complicated than the science. I find science easy. The implementation is extremely difficult, and that's where the difficult solutions have to be found. But we have to have the science in the first place. Question over there, yes. Hi, uh, Re Ooh, that's very loud. Reese Phillips from EADS. Um, talking to uh, people who've been involved in tissue engineering in the past, I'm aware that there's obviously a lot of backlash, and in, in some cases, people who are against the idea uh, can actually be quite threatening to those who are engaging in research in it. And similarly to doing work in the non-developing world, I think there are some parts of the world who don't understand what you're doing, and um, uh, certainly in the area I work, there are people who think that th that topic is witchcraft. So how do you get around these sorts of uh, moral issues and the educational issues? I guess that might be more directed at, at, at me. Yeah. But I, I would, I mean, I guess to me, any area of science, I mean, there can be some good things and some bad things. I mean, I guess the way I think about it is I'm, I think the people that do what we do, we're in it for the, the cures and the treatments that it can give and that it can prolong life and relieve suffering. I mean, I think certainly anything that can do something good, there's the potential to do something bad. Uh, but. Uh, to me, in almost in all these areas, I just 
think that the number of people you're helping just far outweigh, you know, the kind the kinds of negative negative considerations, uh, at least in my mind. Yes, Krishna from Arizona State University. Uh, I hope I'm correct in understanding that uh, the cost of vaccination, you know, almost 80-90% of it comes from the needle to deliver the chemical rather than all the development that goes behind that. Has there been a lot of research done on uh, you know, cost-effective delivery systems uh, uh, that can be used in, in these worlds where uh, the resources are limited? Who would like to uh, address that? Needles are not the only way to deliver a vaccine. There are many, many other ways of delivering vaccines. Uh, needleless in, 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 uh, uh, injections, uh, patches, uh, I mean, polio classic. You take it as a tablet or, or not a tablet, a bit of uh, sweet. Uh, so a few drops on a sweet. So there are n numerous ways. And I think the delivery mechanism is getting better and better with better engineering. I mean, we have one famous engineer here who's developed one uh, 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 needless injection system, uh, which, is, uh, which is really has gathered a huge amount of pace. Thank you. Questioner there? Is, do you? No. Okay. Gentleman there then. Yes. Jyoti Mazumdar from University of Michigan. My question is more of a philosophical. What I, while I was listening to this afternoon, uh, like uh, Professor Darzi was talking about sending surgeon for six weeks of engineering course. Uh, we have these boundaries for electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, medicine. Did we, can we think of a totally new of educating people and instead of saying that uh, I'm studying mechanical engineering, we look at a problem like cancer engineering and we teach them everything needed around that Instead of putting basically in uh, chimneys we built hundreds of years back. Does, does any, no one has any, everyone's sitting back. Oh, well, so thank you. I'll, 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 I'll try. I mean, and I'm, I'm certainly no expert on this, but I guess to me, if you want to learn about cancer, I mean, I, I, I still think you want to learn the fundamentals first. I still think it's important to learn biology, and, to, and if you're going to learn engineering, to learn the fundamentals of that first. I think that, you know, what we've tried to do at MIT, you know, just as, as one example, is, uh, you know, I think people come and they learn biology, they get a PhD in biology, or they get a PhD in engineering. What we've done recently is create a building, though, which is half, you know, biologists and half engineers, and Angie actually is in that building, too, uh, and with the idea that you could have engineers uh, interact with biologists in, in fundamental ways to do research, but I, I, I and and that's all aimed at at better cancer research. But I still think that uh, uh, learning the fundamentals to me, you have to do that first. That that would just be my my personal opinion. I don't know if anybody agrees or disagrees, but I think they all agree. Robert. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> we have about two minutes left. There's one question up there, and then I have another question coming from the Birmingham audience. Hello. Hi, um, Amber Hall, uh, bioengineering student from the University of Toledo. Um, there's, it's obvious that healthcare costs, at least in the developed world, are just increasing astronomically. Um, what's to say that we, as, especially as aspiring engineers who will be graduating soon, um, couldn't take the simpler technologies that we're trying to infiltrate and distribute amongst the developing countries and bring them to our developed countries first, or parallel um, to get those distributing ideas done and kind of installed so we can also lower our health care costs as well as provide innovation to developing countries. Rebecca, do you want to say? I think there's a tremendous opportunity for leapfrogging technology. So I'll give you the example of um, surgical pathology. So there's some very exciting microscopy technology that's been developed that could be used to do real-time surgical pathology. And there's a lot of barriers to introducing that in the developed world because we already have ways of solving that problem. In the developing world, they don't. They're very excited in this technology. So I think if it proves useful there, there's an opportunity then to bring it back to the developed world and be able to reduce cost in that way. So I think that leapfrogging is, is a real incentive. 
Our final question then comes from the Birmingham audience. And again, I don't know who's best to, to address this. Um, how do you balance the development of products and services for health with intellectual property against making these discoveries more widely available? So sort of an, an ethical issue. Do you want more? I've stumped everyone with that one, haven't I? <laughs> Poor Birmingham. They asked a question about Mars and, then, and everyone laughed and now they asked a really sensible question. <laughs> it is... It, <laughs> Francis, you look like you're about to say something profound. There's absolutely nothing wrong with making a profit, right? There's nothing inherently wrong with making a profit in providing goods and services to people who need them. What we need is further assistance, though, to disseminate the technologies where profit is less certain. Thank you very much. I think we will draw this session to a close. Um, I, I'll give the, the, um, the panelists a chance to get back to their seats before we segue smoothly on immediately to the next section. But in the meantime, please join me in thanking all five speakers again. <laughs>